so epigenetics kind of speaks to that. It's the various things that turn genes on or off the genes that you already have. Mm -hmm. So your hard, your hard coding is your genetics and your genetics doesn't necessarily determine who and what you're going to be. Um, as much as the things that you decide to do with your life and expose yourself to that turns those genes on or off. You're listening to the Restoring Human Movement podcast, where movement experts discuss the latest evidence-based practices to help you and your clients move with mastery. And now, your host, Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez. Hey guys, it's Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez, your host for the Restoring Human Movement podcast. Thanks for joining the Movement Movement Today, I'm going to have on a guest. This is Philip Snow. He's been on one time before, and you hear a little snippet of what we were going to talk about or stuff we we're going to talk about. Now, again, full disclosure, just as in the other episode, uh, Philip, as well as Ben Ramos and I, are part of a um, online continuing education platform that we formulated ourselves to scratch our own itch because we want online continuing education to be game changing. And this is going to be game changing, as you're going to tell by this uh, this this interview here. So I'm going to have Philip kind of figure out and categorize and talk about some of the all all the stuff that is uh, new in regards to spines that uh, we a lot of times as as clinicians do not have time to go ahead and learn because he's digging through the research for us. If this is your first time on the podcast, thank you so much um, for joining me. There are a ton of things in the archives if you're interested, and I my personal experience through podcasting so far is that I can tell you that I practice very differently now than what I did when I started the podcast. And uh, as I learn from each person, is there's many different ways to attack the same problem, some a little bit more fruitful than others. And it's really dependent upon what the person accepts and what the person will tolerate. But if you find the right dosage and the right thing, they resolve very quickly. And by that, I mean sometimes within under five minutes or so, and they can control their own symptoms, which then we... Uh, we, we can empower the patient better. So patients, if you're listening to this, uh, this podcast, the intention is actually to blend the line between medical and uh, lay public so you guys can understand some of the more complex topics that we really want you to understand because we think that you deserve to know, but also too, it helps unveil the curtain, uh, the mystery that is how to get over some of these conditions that you, get, that you have. And this one, we're going to go over mainly back-related stuff. Now, Again, full disclosure, we do have that course, and the and over the next few weeks, I'm going to be interviewing the presenters that are in the course. We pay these presenters to be uh, to submit content to the course. All right, these presenters are legit. Okay, completely legit, and we're going to have. We, there's a lot more of the people that the people who are writing books, the people who are putting on. Uh, 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 workshops and so on, like th those are the kind of people we're targeting to get in here, as well as the hidden gems that you probably have not heard of, but when you hear them, you're going to think, damn, why aren't they actually having workshops and books? And it's because they haven't done it yet. So um, I think that the course is a complete game changer when it comes to practice, because again, it's uh, as I as I think about my entire journey through this podcast, I I see that my practice style has changed and I'm starting to realize the things that I didn't know even existed. And they're very helpful and I plug them in when needed. So um, as you go through that, uh, as you go through the CE course, you're going to find some of those as well. There's a ton of clinical gold nuggets in there. You do get 12 CEs for it, but I'm telling you, don't think the CEs, think about how this is going to game change. This is going to literally change the game about how you practice and it's, it's, it's like the blinders came off. Okay. So, as we go into Phillips' interview today, um, just know that uh, there is more of him. There's four hours of him, actually, in the course, because I think he was a big game changer. And as uh, my past intern, Jeremy Dinkins, would probably say that, that doing that course literally changed the way he's going to practice, as well as uh, I, I, did a, I did a little website consult with, uh, with another doc up in Portland, and he said he took his course as well, the Fix Your Own Back course, and he said it, it changed the game for him as well. And if you want to have some raving fans in regards to the back and disc conditions, Phillips the one to learn it from. So he's very good at what he does, and he breaks it down in a very simple way. So the Fix Your Own Back is the workshop, and I've personally been twice. It's been a game changer. So uh, before we go on the interview, let me share a little bit about myself, because I do believe that you should know your host, and hopefully you should like your host. So um, by the way, on a personal note, 
I've been really attempting to slow down. Like, I think you get the best information from me when I'm a little bit more loose lipped and I can, and I can do some little, little bit profanity, but I'm trying to calm it. So, um, hopefully you hear that from me over the next few months. And I do believe that as I'm listening to all these other experts and even comedians and presenters and stuff, if they're engaging, they don't always need to cuss. And sometimes I, I tend to get a little loose lipped on that. So I'm trying to improve that for everybody. So Hopefully, I'm doing a good job. Let's get to the story and then the the interview. You know, one story I actually forgot about for a very long time was, so when I was a kid, so I'm about 36 now, and if you're around my age, there was a time in life where you actually, if you went to McDonald's, there was 29 cent hamburgers on certain days or 39 cent cheeseburgers on another day, and there was a fish filet and a Friday, I think, and they're all like, they're certain prices, like obviously, like they were... 89 cents, 99 cents, something like that, typically. So when I was back growing up, like I didn't have a ton of money. Like my family wasn't poor or anything. We didn't live in the sticks or anything. But um, we'd go over there from school and we'd try to get ourselves a cheeseburger or a hamburger or something. So you go on that certain day, you're like, you know what? Like I'm going to get myself a cheeseburger. But the thing was that, so I'm lactose intolerant, if you guys know me. Um, So I can either choose to take a lactate pill or just simply not eat cheese. Not a big deal, right? So I pull up to the window there, and I'm like, hey, can I get a cheeseburger with no cheese? Because it was 39 cent cheeseburger day. And they're like, no, 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 you, you can't do that. And I said, why not? And they said, because that's a hamburger, and hamburgers cost 89 cents today. And I said, I know, but can I just get a cheeseburger with no cheese? And they're like, no, no, no you can't do that. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, what's the difference? You just take the cheese off. They're like, well, we can't do that. We have to ring it up as a hamburger. I said, okay, fine. Can you give me a couple cheeseburgers? So I took the cheese and took it off. And obviously that cheese is like plastic now anyway. So by the way, I don't eat McDonald's anymore. I think it's been a very long time. Um, gosh, it's probably been like 10 years, 15 years since I had a cheeseburger from McDonald's. But anyway, it's probably why I forgot it for so long. But yeah, cheeseburger, no cheese. Apparently you can't do that because it's a different price. It's a different item. Damn it. You can't just put that double cheese on someone else. You know, like someone else can be really happy with that other piece of cheese. So Makes me kind of think maybe they didn't make it to order, you know, because it was already done. They didn't want to take the cheese off. Anyways, there you go. Cheeseburger, no cheese. Let's get into the content. And the revolution, you know, I would uh, put together these little old man rap uh, songs about um, about the dog and his uh, adventures in uh, Revolutionary War times. And um, um, among those would be a fife and drum corps. A uh, fife and drum, uh, uh, like a parade. So, so General Pfeiffer is one, or sorry, General uh, uh, Chester Pupper. Chester Puppers won many a battles <laughs> and uh, was saluted by a Pfeiffer Pfeiffer uh, twenty one Pfeiffer salute. F I F E. God damn it! Get it right, man. Uh, <laughs> hang on, I'll, I'll uh, put her out. All right, let's go. So I took the liberty of actually recording part of of General Pfeiffer's or General Chester Pupper's story in case you want me to keep that. <laughs> uh, that's fine. fine with me. I don't care. Uh, they just oh, so everyone knows we're human, we're, in, we're, human interest. That's right. Um, he. I bet all of your passwords are something about Chester and General and Puppers, and that was Philip's old puppy. No, a lot of my uh, my. Uh, Second stage security questions are there. Oh, right, right. <laughs> Along with your, your car being your first car's color. Yeah, um, exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Mother's main name. All the stuff you can really find on online anyway. So, mm-hmm. um, okay, well, uh, yeah, so I took the liberty to start it, I guess. Uh, so we'll just, this is an atypical starting point, but that was good. I like that. Everyone likes to know the person behind the mic. Right on. Um, so this is Philip Snell. Dr. Philip Snell, you've been on before, and uh, I introduced you as being a partner of me and Ben's in the Pro Chiropractic Online CE course, and you are number two of the series of interviewing the presenters. Uh, so I thought you can go into a little bit about, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through a quick about who you are and how you got into thinking the way that you do, really. All right. Sim- simple. <laughs> By the way, I don't I, I don't intend us ever interviewing me and Ben about ethics. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. We could go, we could go some uh, interesting places there. 
Uh, well, I, as you said, I am a chiropractor uh, in clinical practice in Portland, Oregon. My focus is on uh, sports med injuries and rehab. Um, my practice, like many people's, it has been um, guided not only by my education, but also by my experience. Um, a major uh, thing that happened to me that kind of put me on the trajectory that I'm on uh, today happened uh, close to 20 years ago when I had a herniated disc in my back um, in my first year in clinical practice. And um, it was in the process of trying to figure out how, uh, one, uh, learning that the things that I had learned in chiropractic school um, at a, a very good science-based school, um, University of Western States, uh, that time Western States Chiropractic College, uh, really did not prepare me to be able to deal with that particular type of injury. And I um, struggled with it for a good long time. And like many people that have that kind of injury, was amazed at the level of pain um, that I could feel and amazed at how it um, uh, kind of really seemed to erode the base of my security systems. Uh, you start to wonder, you know, whether or not you're going to be able to make a living, take care of your family, provide for your child, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, in my process of trying to figure out what the heck to do about all of that, um, I came across the research of Stuart McGill and then that kind of put me on more of a movement and uh, exercise-based rehab uh, model instead of a passive care model. And that's where my practice has gone over the years, and it's taken me into other online exploits. Um, more specifically about the thing that is the, the bit of that or the aspect of that that's being represented on the ProCairo online site in this first module that we're releasing is a uh, two-hour um, two hours of deep diving uh, the epigenetic influences uh, uh, that um, can, uh, the epigenetic aspects of chronic pain and specifically uh, discogenic chronic pain. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So, got this. Yeah, go ahead. So, epigenetics then. Um, actually, I was curious. Did Before you ran into McGill's, did you find McKinsey's? Uh, I found really got into McKinsey stuff a little bit after McGill, but it was, you know, at that point, McGill was kind of given a hat tip towards McKinsey stuff. So what did you find that was even, what, what did anything work until you hit that point or what were you trying? Not, uh, <clears throat> not only temporarily, only very temporarily, like, you know, 20 minutes of relief from manipulation of your back and that it was a coin toss as to whether or not with manipulation, I was going to get remarkably worse or remarkably better. Mm -hmm. um, but never really knowing uh, what was going on was a problem as well. As you know, with working with your patients, it's that not knowing uh, space that the brain starts to fill in all of that gray area with the what ifs. And that's where we start to get into all of our uh, lovely pain neuroscience dialogues too, about how we, probably should do a better job of making sure that in those areas of gray, we give patients some coloring tools to be able to uh, uh, highlight those appropriately with non um messages and, and ideas about what uh, might be going on with their back. So, um, sometimes, sometimes that thing is an actual frank structural injury that needs to be addressed and triaged as such and dealt with as an inflammatory problem. Uh, explain that in, in a simple way that you say to patients to fill in the gray areas. Um, me patient well, scenario. Uh, that, that would, of course, depend on the, the presenting patient, what was uh, driving their particular issue. But if, if that particular patient, say, um, to go with the last thing I was talking about there, if my exam suggested that they had um, an ongoing nociceptor driver, say, at a, potentially at a lumbar disc, um, then I would uh, tell them that that's what I think is going on. Um, but I would hasten to add very quickly that the process can heal once you understand the mechanism of injury and you stop doing that for a while. 
And then going forward, it's about uh, developing uh, muscular control of that particular area and getting stronger overall and being active consistently throughout a life. And as we'll talk uh, in more depth about uh, this epigenetic influence, that uh, those other things that can be done that may actually be even more important uh, have to do with uh, things like sleep, uh, things like diet, uh, things like exercise, and other lifestyle things like uh, smoking, alcohol consumption, and such. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just kind of curious, actually, because, uh, I mean, I've been to your course a couple of times, and the I know I've gotten this when people have come in to see me sometimes. Uh, they look at you and what you do, and they're like, is this is this isn't chiropractic what is this like what are you doing like um what's the response of patients that you get that um kind of follow the methodology that you're that you're using you know you use mckinsey stuff and uh mcgill stuff and um pain science and some dns right and sure so what's their sure. go ahead you know people um i i consider myself you know fair much a, a mixed bag in the type of work that I do, but that's also something of a product of the state that I practice in as well, and the school within that state. I mean, the scope of practice um, for chiropractic uh, is the broadest in the state of Oregon, um, uh, the broadest in the U.S., um, and, uh, you know, we do everything in our training from minor surgery to um, gynecology, um, obstetrics, uh, proctology, and um, a lot of people, even, you know, local folks that live here in Oregon that aren't aware of that are quite surprised to hear that that's part of the training. Uh, Some docs that want to move into Oregon from other states uh, are also quite surprised to find that because they have to pass those board exams and it becomes sort of a back-end regulatory way of... um, uh, managing who practices Cairo in this particular state. But the, the patients, I, I will say, uh, over the years, the majority of my referral system has been built through uh, local um, MDs, clinical uh, internists, and family practice docs. And a lot of those patients. Uh, I've, I've had some patients that I've treated two, three, four times, and they still don't know I'm a chiropractor. And I'm cool with that. Um, it might be I treat someone two, three, four times and don't find that manipulation is the, the thing that uh, I need to be leading with right now, or I'm getting very good effects from other things. And I don't necessarily hold uh, a, a, um, a belief system around uh, chiropractic that suggests that joints have to be manipulated, mobilized um, by another individual in order to maintain health there. Uh, Uh, I think we can teach people how to move themselves. As I say, uh, as I say to patients all the time, a joint to be healthy, has got to be moved and I can move it or you can move it, but I come with price. (laughs) Um. Tell me about epigenetics because I know that's what you're uh, that you're just you're just non at the bit. Probably the <laughs> probably the uh, the easiest way for most of us to conceptualize it based on the the physiology and pathology courses that we took in school is uh, gen- you've got you remember genotype and phenotype and uh, that genotype is what you know your genetics are and phenotype is what uh, is sort of that uh, um, uh, exposure to whatever life, lifestyle, diet, exercise things um, will cause those genetics to express themselves or not. Um, so epigenetics kind of speaks to that. It's the various things that turn genes on or off, the genes that you already have. Mm-hmm. So your hard, your hard coding is your genetics, and your genetics doesn't necessarily determine who and what you're going to be um, as much as the things that you decide to do with your life and expose yourself to that turns those genes on or off. And uh, some of those genes can be um, bigger genes and some of them can be smaller genes. Um, they can <laughs> 
typically bigger in genes and smaller in genes have a uh, relationship to each other in the way that uh, different signals are received by cells that turn on or off those genes. So uh, the, ep the epigenetic part is, a, I, I think, probably in the next few years, we're going to hear enough about all of this that we're probably all going to start calling it a fad. Because uh, that seems to be the way things go, isn't it? You know, when the science right. first comes out, everybody gets really interested. And then when everybody starts talking about it, then it's kind of like your favorite band when you were in college, you know, and you knew them when they were cool. But wait, so what was your favorite band in college anyways? I don't know. <laughs> R.E.M. was up there. I, I really liked R.E.M. R oh, R.E.M.? The, uh, um, the, what, is it, what did R.E.M. mean? I know it was an acronym. Well, rapid eye movement, um, but I don't know what what from, <laughs> what the uh, the Athens Georgia band had. I like I like Athens Georgia. I like the B fifty twos and R E M. Um, the B fifty twos. Did they have anything beyond those couple? Oh Jesus, man! Oh God, there's you gotta, there. You got to hip yourself. I I really <laughs> hip myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's there's a couple songs just in existence that I wish I would never hear again, and Rock Lobster is one of them. Um, and uh, there was the other one. What is the? Uh, they they did another one, which is it was just too much trouble. It just it set me over the edge. It it was my trigger for my epigenetics uh, episode. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, um, what kind of things can I? So, actually, question: When you turn on a gene or a turn on an expression, can you turn it off? Absolutely. Or, okay. Uh, what are what are the common triggers? And then, um, how would you then? decrease the expression well um <laughs> let's take an example more specifically for um back pain and maybe even more specifically for discogenic back pain um the genetics that have been most robustly associated with pain um are genes that control the the inflammatory process and of the inflammatory cytokines that tend to express around an injured disc, the one that is thought to be um, one of the first, if not the first, and the most important one that kind of kicks off the inflammatory cascade is tumor necrosis factor alpha, that's TNF alpha. And the that inflammatory cascade um, locally and systemically, um, TNF-alpha then stimulates release of three other cytokines, interleukin-8, uh, interleukin-6, and interleukin-1-beta. And all of those, um, you can envision this as your salt, pepper, garlic powder, and onion powder for your stew of the hot mess that an injured disc is. And you're going to see those those flavoring adju adjectives or adjuncts um, in that particular stew uh, when a person is hurting. Now, um, doesn't necessarily mean that a person who has an injury to those particular structures is going to be inundated in those. Stews. Some people have more continue our analogy, salt, pepper, garlic powder, and onion powder in their cupboard, and, the, uh, and they don't have the shaker um, uh, uh, calibrated part. part <laughs> uh, yeah, the shaker part on the top. The, uh, they just have the pouring part on the top. So when they try to put a little bit of those things in, they get a whole lot of that stuff instead of a little bit, and they aren't able to meet it out. A common restaurant so, joke in Portland, I'm sure. Yep. Well, I'm 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 literally right now. I've got a, uh, a beef brisket on my Traeger, and um, I'm watching my clock because I've got to get down there when it hits 170 degrees and pull it and wrap that sucker for the last uh, <laughs> five, five hours of cooking. But uh, anyway, <laughs> I digress. Uh, <laughs> Everyone gets more excited about Traegers and st and smoking than really anything else we talk about. Yeah, this is true. This is this is true. You know, if there are comments on this conversation, wherever it is, I guarantee the majority of them will be about the, my dog and 
<laughs> Probably. <laughs> and the trigger. You, you know, as as I go through, like, so I look at the audio on the other side when I'm just checking things mm-hmm. out, and uh, I try to pull a nice snippet that I know is like a good intro. Yeah. And so you usually can tell where someone gets excited because there's spikes in the audio, right? I guarantee you all those spikes are going to be talking about dogs or talking about briskets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll fit cats in here so that we get good numbers online. But uh, where was I? So, uh, so a good example is that tumor necrosis alpha gene. Well, um, that gene or one of the genes that um, uh, turns TNF on uh, or off is um, it's controlled somewhat by downstream processes associated with B12 metabolism. So let's say, and, and the, the people that are uh, affected by that TNF-alpha gene um, uh, issue often genetically tend to be of Northern European stock and they tend to look a little bit like me, uh, redheaded and very light skin. And they're the, uh, the, the, the folks that we, you know, those of us in this camp know our skin tends to redden with some sun exposure instead <laughs> of tan off. And if we, you know, we tend to have high histamine responses and things like that. So that's a reflection of that TNF alpha gene uh, being preferentially expressed in that particular way in that genetic pool. Now, if you put, uh, since that's regulated by B12, if you put a vegetarian or a vegan diet on top of that same individual, then the B12 that normally would help to deacetylate um, the, uh, the, the portions of the gene that turn it off, um, those things won't be present. And that person, when they are exposed to an inflammatory insult, it'll tend to run uh, faster and longer and harder than the average individual. So, mm-hmm. then, you know, in, re- in regards to the, the two hours that are on our module that we've got here, um, part of what we discuss is how do we go in and evaluate that one in an individual in front of us. And two, how do we intervene at what points and uh, deep dive to try to help that person, not only in their current pain situation, but maybe to make a uh, longer lasting, deeper impact on their quality of life. So, so from when you're in clinic then with somebody and someone walks in and they say they're intolerant or flexion and they can extend okay, and you, you got to mechanically kind of desensitizing, do you then... Do you then use an epigenetic approach immediately and talk about that kind of stuff? Or do you, you wait a little bit and uh, wait until they're kind of like a non-responder? Or uh, how does that usually go for you? <clears throat> sort of sort of along the lines of what you saw in the course when you came, um, Seb. The, uh, part of the, the information here can be gleaned from the history. Um, that the patient fills out for you and that you, uh, you flesh out in your conversation with them. And that's where a lot of these epigenetic issues where your suspicion comes out. You know, if we just look at the primary um, points of entry that we'll have clinically for this, for dealing with this kind of stuff beyond pain, um, it could be uh, systemic stress in that individual. They're going through, um, you know, a, uh, a particularly difficult time in life? Is it something that they are, you know, are they, I don't know, are they losing a job or are they you know, trying to meet a book deadline or something? Is it, it's going to be unremitting stress for a period of 18 year years, or is it going to be an unremitting stress for the next 18 days on uh, that kind of stuff? So stress would be one mm-hmm. sleep and sleep quality um, and getting inside of it and figuring out why. Um, the sleep is is disrupted beyond just saying, oh, I see you have an Ambien prescription. Well, you know, it looks like you're not sleeping well and then kind of scooting on with that. Uh, diet, looking for uh, diets that are high in inflammatory, um, uh, in diets that are known to cause an, an increased inflammatory response. Uh, diets high in uh, simple carbohydrates, high in carbohydrates in general. Uh, a hyperglycemic status in that particular individual, hyper as opposed to hypo, 
Um, what's their alcohol intake? Are they smoking? Things of this sort. So I note those. And then because most people, when they come to see people like you and me as chiros, they're not necessarily really there for, um, for a whole lot of deep diving into those particular areas. So sort of using motivational interviewing techniques with those patients, I might at that point in time say, hey, I'm glad that we're getting some response here mechanically by doing our end range loading on our first visit by teaching you a little bit about um, uh, lifting techniques and such and exposing you to some of that. But uh, I do see that there might be some other areas here that this um, that might be holding you back a little bit. And we might want to save that for a conversation later. Mm -hmm. But since you're at a, you know, a one or a two today and you came in with an eight, then we're going to call that a good day. I'm not going to, you know, beat them over the head with that um, right out of the gate. But Mm -hmm. in that individual, it's in the, in their history, they probably also have some other, maybe a previous knee injury or previous hip pain or previous shoulder issues and we can link all of that back to the diet, the stress, the sleep, and all of those other things, mm-hmm. as well as the other uh, issues in their life. You know, are they uh, are they diabetic? Are they pre-diabetic? Do they know? Um, have they been tested? Uh, do they have family history of cancer? And does that worry them about the possibility that you know they uh, they may have? Uh, their mother died of cancer, of breast cancer, their grandmother died of breast cancer, and they're trying to figure out, you know, whether or not they want to be tested for uh, the BRCA genes. Um, all of those things can factor into those, uh, those questions about the, the individual. And that kind of goes a little bit into uh, an opinion shift that I've had as I've gotten deeper into this, which I'll go ahead and drop out there and we'll see where it goes. Um, There's a a bit of a movement these days for for us to look at the biggest things that take people off of this planet. Uh, Those those things, the the, uh, biggest cardiovascular disease and cancer far and away, uh, those are the two biggest causes of death. Stroke is high up there. Alzheimer's disease is now high up there as our baby boomer generation ages into that. Um, The uh, uh, opioid epidemic, interestingly, has uh, deaths due to uh, opiate uh, um, overindulgence Mm -hmm. uh, has, uh, if memory serves, recently overtook accidental ex- accidental death things like car accidents is the number four cause for mm-hmm. injury uh, for um, mortality so if you look at all of those things that um, tend to take people off of the plant planet except for you know um, uh, an opiate uh, compromise or a uh, uh, injury uh, um, accidental death if you t- if you look at those major things our our current research is suggesting that we look at them from a metabolic perspective more um our metabolic you know if we think about cancer and where that's gone um something like two-thirds of cancers are uh tend to be diet related and associated uh, highly with uh, hyperglycemic status in the individual. Um, So if uh, I'm thinking that chronic pain and a lot of what we don't know about chronic pain, if we look at it from a metabolic standpoint, um, if we look at it epigenetically, I think a lot of our current wonderings and head scratching and arguments that you hear on social media will go away Mm -hmm. Um, because uh, the same things, and we hear this anecdotally in people that change their diet and lifestyle significantly and they add more exercise, they eat fewer carbs, um, they improve the, the profile of the fats that they eat. 
um, they get a good amount of protein and they get a decent night's sleep. You hear anecdotally in talking to these people that their pain measures go down. The pain that they had in their knees in the morning when they wake up and they go down the stairs isn't there anymore. The pain and recovery aspects um, after exercise uh, tends to get a lot better. So I think I think we might be just scratching the surface here of a uh, a major watershed of information about pain management and mm. looking at it from an epigenetic standpoint. Well, so um, to your knowledge, is there any major like? Uh I don't say companies, I, and, and I don't know if it, governmental would be the right word, but is there any major uh, places that are attempting it to kind of blend that in, or are they still separating those those uh, morbidities with um, separate from like just general fitness kind of thing, you know? I'm not really seeing it, Seb. Um, I mean, if you go on uh, the last time that I did this on PubMed and just did a uh, pull to uh, search for epigenetics and low back pain. Um, when I last did that a few months ago, there were only three papers out there. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you do epigenetics and pain, uh, you'll get a lot more because that pain starts to cross over then into a lot of autoimmune conditions where um, we find that through diet, we can start to uh, modulate those autoimmune conditions uh, a bit better. So, uh, yeah, I think um, I think we're really, especially in our world of, of arthritis, joint pain, um, and spine related pain, we are really just getting into the pool. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm kind of curious with uh, that. Let's just say there's so there's certain things that could be expressed of different severities. And um, earlier when I when I asked about can it be reversed. I bet there's certain ones that people are like, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go. I'll see if I can reverse this thing via, you know, de-expression. Um, but other ones, it's like, it's like if you had uh, um, cancer, it's like, huh, okay, if I lose this one, then, you know, the, the loss is much greater than just suffering from back pain for a little bit. Um, is there, I don't know, what are, your, what, are your, what are your thoughts? I know with back pain, I feel like we can do it a, a little bit more, but with some of the other things, it might be a little freakier for people. <clears throat> well, um, I'm, I don't quite get the thrust of the question, but I think if, as far as the, the, the research goes, it's harder to get money allocated to study pain than it is to study something that's going to kill you. Mm-hmm. And you know, the, when you're studying something that can kill you, um, it's much easier to get allocation of resources if there is some indication that there's a molecular pathway or a metabolic pathway that can, can be manipulated pharmaceutically because then, of course, you've got um, the possibility of getting a, a proprietary drug and you know something that goes there. But there's not a lot of money in saying, you know, you need to get eight hours of sleep and you need to cut out <laughs> – cut out your Twinkies for, and your soda for a bit. And, um, and brisket. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, brisket in the right <laughs> amount at the right time and without carbs uh, added to the whole process. You're right, all keto. Uh, it's all about uh, exposure and dosage with, with uh, brisket, really. Yeah, exactly, like most things. <laughs> so, so, so what's the uh, – when, when, you're, when you're uncovering some of these other things like – uh, sleep and stress and, uh, you know, uh, alcohol and smoking and, and what are, it, at some point when you finally do get to a discussion with someone where you think it's an important part of their recovery, uh, what would be like the percentage that you've observed where people are like, yeah, I'll do that. And they just take it and run with it versus like a little bit more of a forced thrust. Uh, and then you have to put them with some type of like a coach or a counselor, you know what I mean? Uh, for for my patients, all of all of my patients, again, you say coach, and you know rather than a life coach or counselor, which I mean you're in California, and even though we're <laughs> up in Oregon, we uh, we we're not quite that far down the garden path yet, where everybody needs a coach in order to figure out how to get their shoes on and go to work today. Well, we need a thing called ways to get us to work. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, the. Um, Hell, I don't know where we said. Uh, um, uh, are people willing to run with it? <clears throat> yeah, I think 
I find that um, the degree to which people are wanting to run with it uh, usually is directly correlated to their amount of time that they've been dealing with the issue. You know, it's a chronic issue and how severe the problem is. Uh, in regards to di a painful disc injury, it's often remarkably painful, like some of the worst pain that an individual is likely to feel in a life. And, you know, they're, if they go to uh, their GP and they get told, oh, yeah, this will pass, and it, and it does, it gets better, but then it comes back, and then it comes back again. And then they're not able to figure out a rhyme or a reason as to why it comes back when it comes back. So then they've lost their locus of control and they start looking around every corner for a clown to jump out and scare them and make their back seize up. Um, so it's, uh, I think the, uh, in this particular condition, people are much more motivated when they're wondering whether or not they're going to be able to um, uh, take care of their kids and provide for their family or, and do all those things on their bucket list. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have a case that comes to mind where you were able to, to implement uh, a strategy in, in reduction of epigenetics with, with someone with a back condition um, and just kind of uh, give me a little story with it? Sure. Um, I've worked with, um, uh, uh, this would probably would tend to, to factor in more in the deconditioned uh, patients that we tend to see. And in those individuals where they're, we've gone the full mechanical route, we've done all the good things um, that we learn in the course, uh, and their pain level is remarkably down, but they keep having breakthrough episodes or they keep having breakthrough episodes of pain that uh, aren't explained by mechanics. And we've already done our pain neuroscience education, and that doesn't seem to be working uh, so well. More often than not, the biggest two things that I see that are pushing that is stress and sleep. Mm -hmm. And often those um, blend quite nicely together. So your classic patient is not sleeping well because of work or life stress. Um, they have to get up and go to work early. So they slam caffeine. There's a half life of 12 hours in that caffeination. So, uh, they're, uh, they get their, uh, their carb hit somewhere around, um, uh, 10 o'clock, uh, with their, uh, their coffee break. And then another coffee in the afternoon at two or three o'clock, and then when they get home, they slam a little uh, 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 alcohol to try to take the edge off of the day and the edge off of caffeine. So then they go to sleep because the alcohol helps them get to sleep, and yet uh, about three hours later, after they've been asleep for a while that alcohol metabolism starts to cause cortisol release. And now they wake up with what's commonly referred to as the holiday heart. Mm -hmm. And they've got a uh, uh, rapid pulse rate. Um, they're feeling a little bit anxious and they cannot get back to sleep. So what do they do at that point at three in the morning as they're staring at the ceiling where they perseverate about all of those stressful things that they um, didn't get done during the day and they didn't write down. So they're not organized. And then they wake up the next morning and continue to do the same thing. And yeah. then over time, what does that do? The stress, the diet, the uh, lifestyle issues starts to cause uh, often they'll wind up presenting with IBS as well. So now their gut permeability is off and they're not uh, getting as much nutritional value from the, the food they are eating. And uh, maybe they're grabbing more processed stuff and they're eating less raw stuff. So they're not getting magnesium. And the most common nutritional deficiency in the uh, Western world is magnesium deficiency. So now magnesium deficiency can cause palpitations in the heart. And you add all of that to the process and you have 
the possibility for someone to have a actual clinical emergency because they don't have enough. Uh, they have palpitations and arrhythmias that they can't control anymore. I can I can see this as a whole uh, flow chart in the in the yeah. next. <laughs> Um, actually kind of funny. I bet a lot of people like, since they, I don't, I don't personally believe in, in eye watches or whatever they have people now with their wrist all the time. Uh, but it takes your pulse. And I bet if people check that, they probably got the holiday heart every once in a while and they can't, it checks your pulse all night, doesn't it? Yeah. So we can kind of check that thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> just the thought as we start to wrap up epigenetics then, um, I thought you would be a really good one to ask about this because uh, me and Ben talked a little bit about the, the content of the course last time on, on Pro Chiropractic Online, and um, we're kind of going down the route of the flexion and tolerant back. And I mentioned to you both that that if if I had a course like this when I first got out of school, it would have been cha- changing the game. And uh, Jeremy, who uh, went to your Fix Your Own Back course in L.A., he said it just changed the game for him. So you seem to be very good at putting pieces together. So, of the cor- of the pieces of the course that we have, um, is there? Let's just see if you can figure out a way to, to simplify how uh, a viewer would would use the pain science, the epigenetics, the uh, examination that you spoke about. We have the nutrition, and uh, let's just not bother with the ethics portion for uh, me and Ben, <laughs> and um, and and Cody's uh, uh, loading process. So, <laughs> since, since you already kind of. <laughs> You should have, uh, I don't, yeah, it was, uh, we, we said we, we were scared to death to touch another patient after reading those things on, off Nick Mick, but uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm hoping that we don't have to do that very often anymore, <laughs> Yeah. but uh, how would you kind of wrap that up and put a bow on it uh, for, the, for the listener who uh, wants to really be good at flexion and tolerant backs? Oh, uh, well, uh, as we, as we speak in the course, um, there, there is some disagreement out there about whether or not we should be talking about uh, whether or not a disc is injured, if we think it is. Um, if I went to a, a doctor and found out that he thought that I had a particular condition that was related to what I was presenting for, and uh, he withheld information on me, I'd be pissed at that doc. And I'm going to treat people the way that I'd like to be treated. So if I think someone has an injury to a particular structure, I'm going to tell them about it and uh, describe the mechanics. And uh, we'll talk about mechanics and how they may or may not be related. But the biggest issue, I think, is to come right on the backside of that and assure them that the injury can heal if they understand why it, why it happened. And why it happened um, – can be a combo platter, as you well know from from the course and what we talked about in the epigenetics portion here, the module on uh, Prochiro. Um, the this is somewhat analogous to a, a gasoline and fire kind of situation. If you have gasoline uh, a, around a, um, a a source of ignition then when you have that source of ignition, you're much more likely to have an explosion or at the very least a fire that's going to persist and burn for a good long period of time. Whereas if you have the source of ignition, if you've got the spark, but you don't have any gasoline around, you might get a little fire, but it's not going to be a big deal. Likewise, you can have a whole lot of gas. I've got gas. I've got a whole jug full of gasoline in my basement. But there's no ignition source anywhere around it, so nothing's happening there, blessedly. Uh, but you put those two things together, and then we got, we've got some major combustion problems. So what's the analogy? Well, the spark in this case are the mechanics that act, cause actual structural injury. And the gasoline in this analogy are the cytokines that systemically are present in that individual because of the, the way that they conduct themselves in their day-to-day and how their epigenetic uh, epigenetics, uh, as a result of that, have caused cha- certain changes in their genetics to make them more likely to hurt and to make the hurt continue to persist over a long period of time. So um, how we put that together, uh, the first and foremost, we look for the mechanical 
um, triggers that are bringing their pain and making their pain persist, and we try to intervene and cut that out. Um, and we try to do that in, in our explanation in a way that is empowering instead of um, providing them with a whole lot of nocebo. And uh, But I don't go down the pain neuro rabbit hole with everybody, but, uh, but I've got my finger on that pulse to look for when they might be headed south in all of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, once we've got mechanical control there, then a lot of it is about making them more active and getting them stronger. And we put a graded program together to help them um, uh, achieve those, those particular markers. And then beyond that, um, that's when I think the epigenetic aspects kind of come in. I'm, I'm really fascinated right now where, I mean, we're starting to get to the point where we can see, we can actually draw uh, connections between mechanics at the segmental level and epigenetics. Mm-hmm. Now, that's kind of fascinating because, uh, you know, the nucleus um, is primarily uh, uh, glycosaminoglycans, agricans, and it's when we're younger, it's this nice gooey, you know, jelly-like stuff, right? And then we're, we're led to believe that as we get older, it just naturally kind of gets, um, you know, more crab meat uh, in texture, Well, the processes that make it change consistency are uh, epigenetically regulated. Um, For instance, uh, the presence of uh, uh, AGEs, um, advanced glycation end products, um, is related to sclerosis of the end plate and a change in the... uh, the glycosaminoglycan concentration and the resultant stiffening of the motion segment. And, uh, that's fascinating to me. Hmm. And, and TNF alpha can cross an intact disc, an intact annulus. And once it crosses the intact annulus and, and shows up and is measurable in the nucleus causes a change in the metrometallics proteinases, um, uh, in the the annulus to cause a net catabolic effect in the annulus, <clears throat> which stiffens the motion segment. Hmm. So, and as you might recall, too, part of what we talked about in the course is my theory that the the a lot of what we're looking at with chronic lower back pain, I think, is a is manif- a manifestation of perceived or actual threat at. Um, the periphery mm-hmm. uh, at uh, the interface between the nerve root and and or the spinal cord and the structures that are right there because we don't tend to see everything getting loose in that area the, the net the reaction of the body when we have an injury in that area is everything stiffens to make sure that that major neurology is protected mm-hmm. I, I heard though that if you use the protease REM in the area of the nucleus, it, it decreases the attack of the uh, of all the, the problematic area, uh, problematic uh, stuff. I don't remember that song on the <laughs> REM Murmurs album. I don't remember that at all. <laughs> was that before or after last you know, the the last train to Clarksville? Yeah, no, that was the, that was the monkeys. I'm sorry, the monkeys. <laughs> You're throwing me back. <laughs> um. So as we start to wrap up here, what would you like to leave everyone with? Or is there a pressing question you have for me? I'll let you even have the mic if you want. Hmm. Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit curious as to how you think uh, from the receiving side of <clears throat> you've had the course material that all of our presenters um, have contributed for the, uh, the first module. Mm-hmm. What do you think we've put out there that offers any value, Seb, to um, a potential uh, consumer of that material? Um, I think so. I, I I think we did a good job of making it uh, making it very narrow uh, in regards to uh, cases. So we didn't talk about shoulders and necks and um, extension based stuff exactly. Although some of the principles principles could apply over, but. 
Um, I really do think, and I know that we're spending time over the next few weeks talking about this course, and it's going to sound like we're just blowing smoke, but but really it is it's a game changer. It's kind of like going to your course, like it's it puts all the pieces together. And um, even you you had mentioned in your course about the six billion dollar problem that is low back pain, uh, you know, annually. I think it was. Um, we just got to be really sixty four billion is the low end. Oh yeah. Six, 600 billion is the high end 600 that was 600 billion so it was a lot you know and it was uh like after after learning a lot of mcgill's work and and mckinsey's and being able to take away some of the threatening stuff um that people have via like pain science and whatnot it's 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 surprising how well the communication gets uh, when working with people and i had a, uh, a shadowing doc the other day that he was he just brand new grad from school and um, he had not really been exposed to stuff like um, M- uh, McGill's work and McKinsey's wow. and dermal traction. And so these are all new topics for him. And I want to make sure everyone realizes that I'm sure they've said it, heard me say it a couple times. I don't, I don't feel like I know everything, but I feel like I know a lot more than I did. And so he didn't know these. And so going through uh, some of the cases that we did, we had a few new people in. He's like, wow, you're, you're able to communicate really well with your patients. And... Um, like I feel confident with with someone who was doing a farmer's carry it was with like twelve kilos. It wasn't a lot. It wasn't a lot. Two hands, and so uh, I could see the expression on his face, and uh, you know, like, and uh, it wasn't really challenging. He was bending his elbows, and so I feel confident giving him more. And he's, I'm like, how is that? He's like, uh, you know, like he's iffy about it. I'm like, good, let's give you more. You know, so just knowing the risk reward on a on a couple things, I think, is helpful. And so that's something that we learned through Cody's aspect of the course. And just if you're confident with these cases, the person is going to feel that and they're going to be able to trust you and hopefully they'll give you a chance to help them. And I didn't used to have that. And especially with these types of cases. And now I do. So I think when people go through the course, I think they're going to feel that. And whether the person chooses to stick with you or not is maybe a communication issue that we need to improve on. But uh, I know that I did this with uh, uh, that same intern, is, and I probably said it last week too, but uh, there was a person that came in that was very convinced about what their problem was, and I don't believe that their problem was what their problem was. And they kept talking about their, it was in this case, was an umbrella extremity, it was an elbow. So the person kept talking about their elbow, and I said, look, uh, so I stress tested the elbow. We did resisted range of motion. I did all the tests. Nothing was positive, really. The only thing that really changed it is posture dependent. It hurt when sitting up. It didn't hurt when laying down, right? And you know, I could reduce her symptoms with uh, shoulder motion. And uh, so she's like, well, can I go golf? I said, yes. You know, or I'm like, just do short game. And she's just like, as long as you're laying on your back. If you're laying on your back, yeah. <laughs> so, she, so she's like, can I golf? And I said, let's do short game. She's like, but I'm really concerned. It hurts when I putt. I said, go grab a putter. Let's do it right now. So I gave her a baseball bat. That's all I had. And so she's swinging that around a little bit. And so she had a little pain with it. So I gave her some cueing, um, similar to like stuff we would do in, in Cody's section. And then it went away. And then she's like, I'm really concerned that my elbow is going to become damaged by putting. I said, look, there, I did more stuff in this exam, stress testing you. I should have busted your elbow in half if it was compromised. Surely go putt, you know, maybe a little chipping. And so I think the confidence, she liked that I was able to release her with confidence, and I feel good about it. And throughout that conversation, it was mainly about my job was to um, to to let her know that I heard her concerns about her elbow, but also prove to her that it wasn't her elbow. It was a neurological-based complaint. But anyways, long story short is I think everyone's going to feel more confident with these cases, and it's going to help out with your case management. Is that a good answer? Yeah, yeah, I, I think too that uh, another thing of value that's become more notable lately is I've been on the speaking circuit more, and you know we try to get accreditation for all the states for all of the people that come in to see us, but sometimes we miss those, you know. And and uh, if you're a fellow geek, a fellow nerd, you're more likely to cross state lines to go to get your continuing education. Um, somewhere because you really want the information and to learn that rather than just checking off your state mandated CE box, you know, for the number of hours that you got. Well, the net result of that, unfortunately, is that often you wind up crossing state lines and taking course matter that while valuable 
has not been accredited yet by your state board. So now you're stuck. You get to the end of your physical year as a, as a doc, and holy shit, I've got to make up these extra hours to, uh, to, um, um, in order to satisfy my state board. And then everybody goes online and they start doing a whole bunch of online continuing education. And what we're trying to do here is actually get continuing education online for the geeks mm -hmm. so that uh, it's actually material that's of value that uh, you're going to utilize in practice rather than doing what every single one of us knows that we do, you go on to that state mandated <laughs> crap course that really doesn't have a whole lot of value for you. You press play and you walk out of the room and you cook dinner until that module is done. And you come back and you try to muddle your way through answering five or six questions for that module. Uh, we'd actually like to present people with information and material that rivets you and keeps you in your seat and you're taking notes on it, not because you've got a test coming up afterward, but because you know that come Monday morning, this is going to help you with your patients. Right. And, um, I know that like, so yeah, we all do kind of go through that. I've, I've been done, I probably done online stuff, maybe probably three or four years of, of the, of the 10 years out. And, uh, it's, uh, it's just part of the budget. And, uh, so we're just proposing that people change the budget to something better and, yeah. uh, <clears throat> but the, the stuff that the people are going to have is so, um, uh, you have a course, you have fix your own back clinical companion. Uh, Greg Lemon has a course. Cody doesn't, he really should though. Um, and, uh, in the next module, which I know me and Ben alluded to the next module of being upper quarter and cervical spine, but, uh, there, I'm really excited about the people who are going to be on that because it just, it's, it's just dabbles into stuff that you're like, well, I've never had this wine before. And, oh, I kind of like a cab. And then you start to explore cabs. So hopefully that'll expose people to all the things that are at least around. So there's no excuses to not know anymore because the price is pretty good. Um, but in just kind of picking and choosing where you want to spend your CE dollar. Yeah. Yep. But. Yeah, so that's that's all I kind of got on that. But uh, by the way, you didn't ask the question. I was really hoping you were. What are you eating this whole this whole interview? I wasn't eating. You no, were. I know. I was. Oh. It was. It was eighty five percent cacao, and I wanted to know if this is keto. Eighty five percent. Yeah. No. Keto. Keto all has to do with whether or not you're in ketosis after eating it. So mm. um, I'll go get my um, my. <laughs> <laughs> my blood, my blood test kit, and uh, we'll do it right here. Okay. Well, it's would, if I ate only that all day for like three months, would I? Do you think I could theoretically be in ketosis? You'd be pretty close because eighty five percent is doing all right. <laughs> good, good, uh, all day. Okay. Um, well, thanks for being on. Um, how can everyone reach you? Uh, you can find me uh, at. Uh, Dr. Philip Snell on Twitter. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. And uh, we also have a Fix Your Own Back site on Twitter and Facebook as well. Good. What is what is one topic that everyone should ask you about on Facebook that is going to spike your interest? Not clinical. <laughs> <laughs> you need to ask me for uh, cute pictures of my dog. Oh. Yeah, I wish everyone was on the video end end of this. the The dog is cute. Pfeiffer, <laughs> Fife, Fife, F I F E. Awesome! Thanks so much, Philip, for being on. I I learn a bunch every single time that you come on. Like um, even meeting you in the airport and hanging out and uh, you know having a beer. I feel like, or sorry, you won't have the beer. You'll have the tequila, the, the keto man. So um, I learn something every time. So thanks so much, and thanks for thanks for being part of the uh, the content course. So. Again, if everyone's looking for more of Philip, you can find his seminars at fixyourownback.com. Um, the clinical companion, he's probably going to come to your area at some point. And I think he's going to do one, actually. I think I saw Costa Rica or um, a Riviera Maya. That would be amazing. So um, think about that. Again, it will change the course of the way you practice. If, you, if a lot of that stuff was new to you that he said, um, open Pandora's box. Figure it out. There's a lot of good stuff in there, and it'll actually improve your patient care and improve how happy your patients are and um i don't think you'll i don't think you'll lose any money with it you'll you'll release patients quicker and you'll you'll tend to get more referrals i think so if you're looking for the pro chiropractic online ce platform 
which will change the game as you know it. I'll put it in the show notes, but also you can go to Cro, uh, sorry, Pro Chiropractic Online CE, uh, and it will all be on there, and I'm going to attempt to distribute out some of the uh, paraphernalia uh, really quickly here so everyone can see. And uh, yeah, I sorry, I'm a little... Uh, I'm a little unknowing on that. This is the first time we've released something like this, so it's it's kind of funny. I feel like the first go around is going to be a lot of people just referring to each other. So, but I, I we will try to make some very easy tools so you guys can figure out price and um, what will be included and what presenters there are there and so on. But hopefully, this podcast will serve you justice listening to the next few episodes. So, as always, leave people better than how you found them. And if you're dating, dating, dating Eagle Scout, talk to you guys soon.